My name is Dr. And I'm the Director of University Relations for Community Veterinary Partners. In my current role, uh, I have the opportunity to work with those newest to the profession. And tonight's topic is an important message for all future leaders within the veterinary industry. A little bit about Community Veterinary Partners. We're a growing family of animal hospitals and we seek, and our hospital teams seek to provide joy to families by providing the best care possible for the pets that their families love. We're excited to, mar to partner with Royal Canin tonight to host tonight's Vet Fuel event. Authenticity and strengthening the leadership presence in veterinary women. Dr. Laura Pletz is the president-elect of the Women's Veterinary Leadership Development Initiative, and I'm anxious to hear about that initiative as well. Uh, personally, I'm thrilled to introduce Dr. Pletz. I share a personal passion for her message, and it's probably because in 1992, I became the owner of a small animal veterinary practice. And at that time, I knew very few female veterinary business owners, and I actually only knew one other business owner who was also a mother. So obviously, um, the years and the landscape have, has, has changed over the years, but there's still work to be done. And I believe that it's critical for the industry that we promote opportunities for women in leadership roles within our profession. Before I hand it over to Dr. Pletz, I'd like to cover a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, we will have a question and answer toward the end. Um, those questions can be submitted via the chat function if you've joined us online. You can also submit your questions by emailing ask cvp at cvpco.com, or you can text us via 412-400-7447, and that text number is 412-400-7447. And so with that, I'll hand it off to you, Dr. Putz. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here as well, and I love hearing your story and that we share a little bit of something in common in our backgrounds. Um, so I'm really excited. I love talking about this and I'm so excited about what the future holds for the women in our veterinary profession. And I think that um, this is a great opportunity for me to, to talk about this particular topic, but also share um, some resources and, and tell you a little bit more about we call it Wavaldi because as you can imagine, it's a bit of a mouthful. So, and I talk about it quite a bit. So um, I do have my contact information here. I really want to open it up for you guys to reach out anytime, um, whether it's to Wavaldi or to me personally. I'm always here to help with any questions in, in this area or anything else. Um, but I'll get started by telling you a little bit about myself and I and I really was excited to hear um, your story about being one of the few female practice owners. I really that that resonates a lot to me because of my early experiences in the profession. I went to the University of Missouri um, College of Veterinary Medicine for my veterinary degree and pretty right after that I went to St. Louis to find work. I um, wanted to be a small animal veterinarian. My my mission right from the beginning, and I had wanted to be a veterinarian for, I think since I was like five or six, was when I first started saying this and never never steered away from it. But I, towards the end of my last year, I started talking um, and reaching out to practices that had good reputations that I knew of in St. Louis. I knew that's where I was headed. And I really wanted that last free block to be kind of like a job opportunity for both of us or a job interview opportunity for both of us. So I was very upfront about that. I said, I'd love to do my free block with you, um, but I really want to go somewhere that they're looking to hire. We can find out if we're a good fit. And the first place I called was this place I had heard so many wonderful things about. And the response was, you can come work here for your free block, but we're not hiring any more women. And it was really kind of it like took my breath away. I just and I was so young and it was my first job. What was I going to do? Make a huge deal of it. I at the time, I think if, if that happened to me now, you would get a very different response. But um, at the time, I just could. it was kind of a shock to me. And what it ended up resulting in is I found 
there were only a couple female practice owners in the St. Louis area, but I started seeking them out and that's where I began work um, at a clinic called Barrett Station Veterinary Clinic. And I stayed there for 11 years. The last five, I was one of the practice owners. And then around that time, I took a leap of faith to go into industry, actually sold my part of the practice. And that was certainly a big difference. And and I will love, I'll definitely share my story a little bit as I weave this through that, you know, I've really kind of learned the things that are important to me and, and specifically what I'm doing in veterinary medicine has changed a lot, but but the core values really, um, when I think about it, have stayed the same. Um, that's how I ended up with Royal Canin. I wasn't necessarily looking to go into industry, but it was an opportunity that presented itself. And the passion that Royal Canin has for cats and dogs really resonated with me as a veterinarian. And I said, you know, even though I'd never thought of industry as the place for me, I think this is a good fit. And you know, eight years later, I would tell you it was the greatest decision I ever made um, in terms of my career. And I started with them managing their tech services department. So I had a team of veterinary technicians who took all of our calls on on our products, whether it's a vet calling, a consumer, you name it. We we did a little bit of everything. And I had that role for around four years and then moved to my current role at that time, managing our team of scientific services veterinarians on the eastern half of the U.S. that we um we have historically worked in the university space that's kind of becoming its own team now but um you know i they they work with their key opinion leaders and supporting our sales team from a technical standpoint so i have this amazing team of veterinarians that i get to work with and it also gave me the opportunity to be in the field meeting veterinarians all across the united states primarily on the eastern half of the u.s but from everywhere really and you start to just hear and understand some of the same struggles everyone is facing. And I knew I wanted to become more involved in the profession as a whole. And I chose to do that by joining uh, Wavaldi, the Women's Veterinary Leadership Development Initiative. And, you know, this was something that was very passionate to me with my previous, you know, experiences in my early career and being a female practice owner. So, um, I began being active with that group and joined their board of directors three years ago. And then last year was elected as the president elect, which means not next year, but the following year I'll be president for a two year term. Um, so, and, and I put this up here. There's a, I'll t tell you guys more about this later, but we do, I've been involved with a great team that we started three years ago, the Royal Canyon Women's Veterinary Leadership Forum. So I've been able to take this passion and align it um, with what we're doing at Royal Canaan as well. So it just full circle, it all comes together. And then I um, I would be in lots of trouble. My boys are at their baseball training, otherwise I'd be in trouble. But these are my two sons. They're 15 and 16, so they would be very angry with me for having their picture up here, but that's okay. They're all, they're, teenagers are gonna be always angry at me for something, so. Um, and then our two furry friends are Dwight, our cat, and our brand new puppy Jackson who thinks he's a cat apparently because he's up in the cat tree which doesn't make Dwight very happy um so that is a little bit about my journey and I'll I'll weave some of this in as we go through this um discussion on authenticity and how it relates to leadership so so when we think about leadership in general you know what is that definition a person who has a commanding authority or influence, you know, that traditionally the models that we think about are more these power structures and hierarchies, um, transactional type things, the people that get stuff done. That's what we have tended to think about. And frankly, those are models because women have come into the workforce later. Uh, obviously, it's not anything new to us, but um, this was all sort of started around more of a masculine type model. Um, doc, Dr. Pletz, I don't want yeah. to interrupt you, but um, are you sharing your screen? Yeah. Oh, um, we're not seeing your screen. Oh, it must have kicked off because it was on earlier. Let me just reshare it. One second. Yeah, Thank that you. would be great. I just want to make sure that everyone can it see. It did. It kicked off. We had really... Uh, there you go. Okay, perfect. Because I know you have a great right presentation. I wanted to make sure everyone could see it. Awesome. How is that? Is that perfect? That, yeah, and then you just put it in presentation mode. I think it'll work out right. perfectly. Yeah, good deal. Awesome. Thank you. 
All right. Tell me, I just put it in there. So there we go. We yep, good now? Yeah, it looks great. Thank you. Well, then, you know what? Real quick, um, all the stuff that I was just telling you about, I can't let, I can't miss showing you Dwight and Jackson. That's like the, the coolest thing. So, but this is my family. Um, and, um, you know, so I wanted to make sure to show you that. Sorry about it. I didn't realize it wasn't sharing. So I, w I was going to ask to see the boys. So, don't worry. <laughs> so, all right. Well, we got that done. I mean, I can't, I can't if I'm going to be in trouble with them, then I need to make sure everybody saw it. So, um, well, good deal. Um, so back to what I was saying, you know, it, we really have these. It's more it's been more about hierarchy, about power. Um, you know, the way you the way you have power is being higher up. You, that's where you get your authority. Really no other way to do it. Um, and that just really doesn't work anymore. Um, people that's just not really what is fulfilling and what people are looking for, especially younger generations. Uh, it just does not resonate. And, and I think there's some real problems with it. It really doesn't tend to um, leverage the talent of your team. Uh, it just it's it's too much power and and that ladder it just it really makes it hard for everybody to contribute um, it kind of leads to this sense of entitlement and sort of a i would say this this feeling of scarcity right where um you know you know there's only that one spot next that goes up and that's if that's the only place that power is coming from and authority then that's that's not ideal and and in these types of structures, people also tend to manage individuals the same way that they manage tasks, which you can imagine is not very, not very heartwarming and doesn't really create a lot of connection. So it's really just not ideal. And when you don't create this trust and collaborative environment, you have to rely on a lot of motivators that frankly are not very productive. Um, you know, there's too much competition. It's back to that sc scarcity mindset. So. This really just is not an ideal approach. So fast forwarding to authenticity. We talk, you hear a lot about this. I think it's been one of those hot topics lately and some of the um, references that I'll recommend for you all, you know, Brene Brown being one, talks a ton about this. And I just wanna walk through a little bit this, of this. You know, when we think about definitions, Things like not false, it's not a copy, it's real, it's genuine. That's what we tend to think of. And some of the things I've already mentioned here, for example, building trust. Um, that to me is the core of a good team and a good leader. That is really one of the most important pieces. And if you look at some of these other things that align there, ethics, integrity, those are so, so important. Are you guys getting a little bit of an echo all of a sudden? No, just me. There is. Yeah, no, there was a little bit of an echo, but it seems okay. to be away. Seems yeah, to be gone. You're, all right. Yeah. All right. <laughs> no, that's okay. Um, so, you know, uh, having a ton of integrity and really living by these ethics and your core values, that's the really truly the path to building that trust. And we'll talk a lot about aligning your behaviors or your approach to things with your values, that's really the, the big piece here too. That really is the core of this. And some of these other things around challenging old ideas and ways of thinking, you can imagine that doesn't work well in those hierarchies, right? Those power structures, that's, that's not really um, a, a very good approach in those types of a system, but where we allow people to be them, themselves and show up as their true self, we want that, we wanna hear from everyone. And it's really important to be self-aware. If you're not, you're going to have a hard time really knowing what your values are if you really don't have that deep conversation with yourself. And then I think a lot about these, these two highlights here around conversation and supporting each other. Those are really about connection. And ultimately, that's what you gain from authenticity is connection with others. And that's the key to everything. So, I think I've kind of set this up for you all that I think this is important for any leader, um, but specifically we're here tonight to, to hone in on the specific things for women. Um, why does this matter so much? And, you know, what I have tended to see is that when women do make these jumps in their career, I, I, it doesn't often seem to be in the traditional 
you know, up the ladder type thing that does happen um, in these really um, power structures, things like that. It's usually when they're bringing something different to the table, which is why you really want to show up as your true self. So I think that's really important and I've already mentioned, but the millennials that are in our workforce and then and the generations behind them truly do value authenticity. It's very important to them. You know, sometimes I, I know I get uncomfortable with how I look at social media type things, you know, how much people share and I think, oh my gosh, I don't I don't need to know this much. But, you know, obviously you can't overshare. But I think what people really respond to is when we're real and we show the messy sometimes. Life is not perfect all the time. It's not easy all the time. It's hard sometimes and and be there with them in those types of things. And I think for um, for women, excuse me, for women especially, it's important to role model to other women. And when I talk about that, I think one of the most important things I have seen is we know that mothers sometimes it's it's not easy to juggle everything that's on our plate or even if you're not a mother we know that the care for family members maybe it's an older family member tends to fall more on women so there can be a lot of push and pull happening and when you show that you're dealing with that too but you're making it work and this is how you're doing it um, and and help support others for that that really makes that space to for women to see that regardless of their situation, they can show up as their, their true selves as well and be open to figure out how to make this work for them. So that role modeling piece to me, I, fe I think it's just very, very important um, for women, especially with this. So those are kind of some things that I think we see that are really big values uh, of this approach, but so if we don't take this route, if we choose to try to fit ourselves into a model of leadership that doesn't work at all, but we just feel like that's that's what we're supposed to be. Um, what is the cost of that? And I think one of the biggest things to me is when you are trying to grow in your career and you know look to new opportunities, the most important thing oftentimes is understanding what capabilities you need to develop. And the, the truth of the matter is, is if you are not able to be yourself, you can't have the vulnerability that's required to say, I don't know how to do this yet, but I want to learn and find those mentors and reach out. You're, it's really going to stall your ability to develop the capabilities that you need to to make your next step. The other piece, I think, is this duality of, you know, sometimes for women not being able to be them true selves at work. You know, I can't I can't be honest about what my responsibilities are at home. I, I need to pretend like I don't have that going on. So so nobody knows and or they have to suppress their communication style because they don't think it will be as respected. So that dissonance really drains us from an energy standpoint. It's exhausting. It's exhausting. I knew I knew Jackson wouldn't be quiet the whole time, um, but that's it's really exhausting and it, it just wastes too much of your energy that you could be using to move your career forward and, and take care of yourself just to have these mental gymnastics all the time of what you're what you're trying to do to fit into this mold. And I think oftentimes when we're doing that, we are we're trying to, you know, we're trying to find approval from others and what they think. Um, what they think is the particular, um, sorry, um, what they think is a particular, um, you know, what, what they expect from this person. Um, and when they, when you do that and you finally do get approval from someone, but it's as be, not being yourself, it never feels good. Like you think it's going to, but it doesn't. Um, and then I think probably one of the most important things is that um, when you don't feel f fulfillment in your job, which it's really hard to, if you have to show up with this mask, and I, I have to, I used to always talk about having this mask on. Well, now we all have that all the time, so it's probably not the greatest metaphor anymore. But if you, if you have to show up that way all the time, it, it really is not fulfilling. And so then when you, when women find themselves faced with these situations of. I've got all these responsibilities at home. 
I have this going on at work. If it's just not rewarding, then there's a good chance that that's going to be part of why you choose not to um, to stay in the workforce. And it's why a lot of women would tell you that they take that off ramp sometimes. So I think, you know, one of the next things that I really kind of wanted to dig into um, is that sometimes what's important to women is very different. Um, these are some things that kind of stood out in a particular study that was done by um, Corn, um, Corn Ferry around and that what they did is they asked several women um, that they considered to be high potential and some of that some of them that had already reached the CEO level and they they pulled out some that were in the business um, in the business arena and they sometimes even had higher numbers which are where these are but for example um, the last one there was actually a number that was a little bit lower if you were in some other tradition or some other career path but maybe not what would be considered traditional business so let's just walk through these a little bit um, ability to associate with people that they respect like that really means a lot to women um, it means a lot to everybody but they scored significantly higher um, in comparison to some men that were asked these similar questions and free to be themselves at work. I think that is extremely high 79%. That's really important. And I think I think everybody wants to do that, but I think it becomes more pressing for those of us who sometimes feel like we're needing to to put that mask on or be somebody a little bit different when you're when you're showing up as you know that more that masculine model and that feels a little bit easier this might not feel as important even though it probably is important to everyone um flexible schedules again we've kind of hit on this a little bit but women really bear the brunt of the unpaid labor in our society um, it's a consistent finding globally um, I've even I've seen somewhere that globally women do 75% of the unpaid labor. So all of the care at home and, and things like this that um, that tends to fall to us. And so it's not so much that we don't want to work or have the capability to do it, but we might just need to be a little bit more flexible with that. And then the collaboration within a team and this comes back to less of that power structure type situation, but really wanting to work with a group and work all together. That's really important as well. And this last one, um, if you take this, this was for the group um, in business, but for all women when they were asked, 15% of them cared about a powerful position. It just wasn't that important. It just really is not that important to them. I think um, what this kind of tells you, they don't ask this specifically, but all of these kind of dance around that there's a purpose to their work, it's a fulfilling job. Um, it, it what they're doing matters. Um, it's not about having the top rung um, and being in charge. So, so now that we've kind of talked through um, through some of this, before we start diving into the tactics, I just would wonder. I would love to. Does anybody want to drop in the chat some of the ways in which that they have felt like? they maybe have not been able to show up as authentic um, are they, is it is it hiding your family responsibilities pretending like you don't you're not stressed out that you need to get to daycare to pick up on time or you have sick family do you feel like there's more of a penalty to that wonder are you guys keep it if you could keep it let me know if anybody's popping that in there i would love to hear I don't see any. Yeah. They're probably too busy watching the crazy puppy who's misbehaving. <laughs> um, um, I, no one's popping in there, but okay. I, you know, from being a mom myself, I will absolutely say that yes, I have been sitting in meetings or in um, in situations where you know you need to be really present with what's happening um in 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 your work and with with your with your client with your patient but in the back of your head you know that you 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 may not be able to to um to to to, to be as present because you know that you've got to get out the door to go pick somebody up or get somewhere up because there's another calling for you that you've got to be at so i i have personally been there 
Yeah, absolutely. And I think I, I know in addition to that, I've also oftentimes kind of tried to really tone down and and maybe hide some of my true feelings to avoid, you know, creating conflict and things like that, um, because I think women oftentimes are judged a little bit differently about those types of things. So I think there's just a lot of ways that we can that we can deal with this at times. So uh, well, there is one in the chat yeah. that says uh, agree. There are always struggles with self pressure of being a wife, mom and career woman. Yeah, absolutely. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. You know, when I do talk to students, I, I see this this thing and you know we've talked about the amount of unpaid labor and that we do take on a lot of this care but what what's difficult is we're really trying to um to gain this equality in the workplace and and do those same things show up there but we're we're not always asking for that at home um, and that leads to so much stress and burnout it i hear it over and over from women so i think when we dig into some of these values-based conversations with ourselves, we can really dig into that and make sure that we're making the choices that we really want to make, um, not what we think we're supposed to make. Um, all right, well, good. Anything else before we dive into these four things? Uh, there was one more that says fear of uh, fear of looking unprofessional if you show show that you're that you're dealing with um, personal challenges. Yeah. Um, multiple factors, especially as a woman, a minority business owner, wife, mother, non-visible illness. Um, those are some of the things that people are sharing. Yeah, absolutely. All of those. And and it's 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 difficult because I think that unfortunately, I wish it wasn't this way, but there are those biases out that exist, uh, whether they be explicit or implicit that sometimes women or especially women are really different for behavior. I think that's something that we have to all work on together as well. And and it's not the focus of this particular talk, but I will say that this authentic approach to leadership is going to be key for us to make the pro improvements and the progress for our profession that we need to. Uh, in the area of diversity and inclusion. That's something that we know as a profession that we have opportunities for and having authentic leaders who will be real about this are driven by that purpose. They're the type that can really make change happen. So that's going to be key to the future of our profession from that respect as well. All right, so the four things that I kind of want, and we'll walk through each of these in great detail, but you know, I put them in these buckets to just try to help help organize this a bit. But it's really the first piece is this self-awareness, knowing what really matters to you, who you are, um, and taking the time to to understand that about yourself. And then taking that and evaluating how that's aligning with your behavior and your actions. And then after you've sorted that out, what are the actions that you're going to take to become a more authentic leader? And we can talk, we'll talk through that. You know, doesn't have to be small, doesn't have to be big changes. It can be little things. Sometimes that's the best path. Um, and then finding your support um, and then giving it to others. So this is really more about that connection piece. So in terms of the self-awareness, we talk about this a lot sometimes in terms of understanding how we behave, how we come off in certain situations. So I'm talking less about social self-awareness now and more about that internal piece of knowing you, what matters to you, what is going to give you purpose in this job? Like what are the things that really, you know, make you want to get up and do your job during the day? And I think that, you know, this is something that is absolutely crucial. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, I, I look, I see this in all respects of the, of the clinic. Um, it might be a veterinarian who is, is wanting to do something more and take on a leadership role and is just afraid to speak up and things like that. But, you know, have that deep conversation and say, what is it that I want that will give me more fulfillment in this. Veterinary technicians, 
want to do more, want to manage the practice, you know, be part of that management, part of, you know, what's next. And um, and I think that, you know, have those conversations with yourself to understand what really matters to you. My wellness is very important to me. It is the what I'm doing and how I'm showing up at work every day. Is that tearing that down or is it bringing it up? Um, you know, and lifting that up and back to what I was talking about in terms of our commitments to our families. You know, I think, again, we try to have um, we try to have equality in the workplace, but we're not asking for it at home. So if that's really important to you, your work is really important. I think, you know, ask yourself, are you is is the situation at home what it needs to be to support you? And if not, just like you need to have conversations at work sometimes about this is not working for me, it's fine to do that at home. Just because society has kind of played things out like this doesn't mean that we have to just keep going on and, and keep doing it. I can't tell you how many people, you know, just complain how exhausted they are, but they're afraid to say, I don't want to do this because of the expectations that are put on us as wives, partners, mothers. Um, but we really need to do that for ourself and for our um, our wellness and our well-being. So once you understand what these core values are, you know, and, and sometimes people like to talk about specific, maybe you make a list, you know, is it the integrity? Is it trust, um, honesty, communicate? What are these things that are so important to you? And then even deeper, sometimes specific of what, what it is you want to be doing um, to fill you know, that fulfillment that you want out of your career. And then look at your behaviors that you're taking. So I, for example, I talked about wellness being very important to me. Now I'm not in the practice environment anymore, but I remember when I was, it was so like the days would go by, you would hardly eat anything. You're just running from one appointment to the other. If you did eat something, you were eating something very unhealthy while you were writing in records and doing all of this. Um, I've actually been working with a group, uh, started working with a new coach and she, she has several clients that are veterinarians and we talk about this all the time that we, <laughs> there's a really a problem with how we take care of ourselves during the day and, you know, you have to say, okay, I'm saying this is important to me, but then everything that I'm doing is not aligned with this and then talk about physical activity, all of those things or talking about how important time with your family is and constantly you're missing things um, and not because you need to to do your job but because you have been afraid to say i need to go for a fear of judgment of what's going to happen even though you were supposed to be done um, so you know you can't can't make all of these choices with what you're doing in your behaviors while saying that what's important to you because that divide is not going to bring happiness at all. So really just looking at all of the behaviors and how you're approaching your job and your career. You know, that's really going to be key here to see where the misalignments are. And then once you figure that out, then you've got to move on to the next step, which is really around. All right, what am I going to do about this now? And I find that everybody, when they want to start making a change, they tend to, um, they want to go big, right? They want to do this huge thing. They want to have this big discussion and list all the problems and, and just work it all out. I'll figure out what those few things are and change little small things at a time. Maybe it's setting boundaries around your lunch hour um, or when you're leaving or the types of things that you're not going to um, the types of client interactions that you really don't want to have. So, you know, really think about what are those small things that you want to change and be willing to share those conversations um, with your with your employers as well. And I want to talk a little bit about something that I see a lot is um, one of the big things. Um, actually, it can be a small thing, but it happens a lot is I noticed that women apologize a lot for just even taking up the slightest bit of space or expressing an opinion or, you know, anything around that. So I think that is a huge opportunity 
for women to to really become aware of that. I've tried to shift my language and not say, I'm sorry if this is a silly question or, you know, I'm sorry I wasn't able to make that, you know, just if things like that, just state you have the right to be there and and have an opinion and share your authentic feelings and stories and, and don't apologize for it because it really um, it diminishes it. And, you know, I love now saying thank you for waiting for me. Um, thanks for understanding that I really could not do this time because I had another commitment instead of always feeling like I need to apologize. I think those are things that they're little, but they really show that you're taking, you know, ownership of what matters to you um, and going to show up just as you are. And then I think, you know, the support piece all along, I've kept coming back to this really is about when you talk about authentic leadership, it's about building connections. And, you know, a lot of the way you do that is by building your support network. And that also means you being part of a support network and providing that support for others. So this is really key. And I think a lot of times we we know how important mentoring can be, especially for for women. Um, you know, as we talked about in the beginning here, many of us didn't have a lot of role models and mentors that had navigated practice ownership and different leadership roles as a woman. And so those things are really great to help with that. But I want to talk to about the difference between mentorship and sponsorship. Our first our first go to always when we're talking about how do we get more women or how do we get more a more diverse leadership team. How do we how do we provide this support? It's always mentoring, mentoring, mentoring. And that's really wonderful. You cannot have mentoring plays a key role in all of our development. But when we're talking about making bigger steps into leadership and things like that, sponsorship is really key. And the difference is mentors are the ones that are talking to you about your career options, helping with guidance, helping suggest ways to develop your skills. But those sponsors are the ones that when there's opportunities that come up, they speak up for you when you're not in the room. They say, hey, that Dr. Pletz should do that. Like, you should really check this out. Like, they have a great skill set here. Or whoever, you know, they speak up for you when you're not there. And they are traditionally some of the people that do have some significant power. That is really important and one of the things that tends to hold uh, women and minorities back. We are really traditionally over mentored and under sponsored. And the reason why I'm talking about this in terms of authenticity is the way that you're going to get people to support you is by showing up in an authentic way where they will know this is what this person can bring that no one else can. That's what makes them want to stick their neck out to speak up for you in your absence. So it's that is why I think it's really important. So when you're thinking about building your support network, really make those real connections. Let people know who you are and what you bring that no one else brings to the table. And, you know, I think that is so, so important. And then we talked a lot about what it's like to to navigate some of these things whether you're in veterinary medicine or whatever, as a woman with your with family responsibilities, other things like that. I really encourage people to make sure that they're taking a broad view of what a support network looks like. Um, I can tell you I speak from the experience of being a divorced mom and sometimes it's hard to feel like, you know, you, you you're single. You don't have always have that family structure, whether you guys got along or not you're still the same family and you have to have that you have to continue to support each other and i have to rely on him as as their dad when they were much younger to help me we could not both have our careers without it um friends that help you um you know it takes a village like they say i really encourage people to make sure that they think think about that all right so those things are some of my tips just to kind of help you set you on that path to a more authentic approach. You are just a pistol today. Um, set you on that more authentic approach to your leadership style. And this is from Brene Brown, and I absolutely love this. You know, all of these changes that we've talked about and and really just 
putting yourself out there take a lot of vulnerability and and that takes courage um, and I just love this it starts with showing up and letting ourselves be seen um, I absolutely love this and I wanted to highlight specifically the resources here around um, her most recent book dare to lead it really digs into a lot of this courageous leadership and and how it's really not about you know who's in charge and things like that it's you know it's influencing others by by the way that you show up as your true self how women rise is another amazing book this this talks about sometimes the things that make us really successful early on in our career um, they, they don't help us make those next steps and Marshall Goldsmith who wrote this with Sally Helgeson is the one that does what got you here won't get you there what something like that um, but it really talks about how you do need to shift some of those things so these 12 I think there's 12 behaviors or or things habits that sometimes can be stallers for us so it deals with that and then this designing your life is a bit of a different one I don't know if you're some of you may be familiar with um, design thinking, but it's it's really this approach to problem solving and this takes and they take that that's usually used for like innovation and things like that. But how do you do that same process to really design the life that you want to live? And and a big piece of that is around, you know, showing up as your true self and what it is that you really want. And please, you know, please go to our website and this is where I'll tell you a little bit more about the Women's Veterinary Leadership Development Initiative. This is our website where you can find any events that we're having, our newsletters, Facebook, Instagram. Um, we're on all of those as well, so don't hesitate to look there for us. But really, this is an organization that started um, several years ago and has grown significantly, but it recognized that we do have this shift in the demographics of our profession that's been going on for 20, 30 years now and we, we're just not seeing the leadership happen as quickly now very exciting you know this next time that we have a avma election we will have a woman president which is amazing we're really excited about that but this just calls out that piece that with this demographic shift if we don't invest in developing women leaders our profession will not be led by veterinarians um, so i think this is just a really um, our mission i think is really important and we want to provide those opportunities for women to grow and develop and um, you know we have lots and lots of ways to do that always educational opportunities will be at conferences um, virtually now of course but um, lots of amazing chances to connect with other women there as well and then earlier I mentioned the Royal Canaan Women's Veterinary Leadership Forum. This is something that I started with a team at Royal Canaan three years ago and we had some in person events and this year we are exclusively virtual just like everyone else and it's been a great opportunity because it allows us to reach so many more people and provide this information and education to a much larger audience. It's kind of that silver lining of COVID. I think we can find a few if we try, and this is definitely one of them. Um, so this is where you can find more of those opportunities, but I wanted to share with you, this is the most current series that we have. It's um, We're calling this the Know Your Worth series, and basically it's looking at kind of some different things here you know negotiation obviously is a is a topic that that's important to all of us um, and then Amanda Donnelly did something that she really dug into just that values piece that we've talked a little bit about tonight and um, and then Jessica Vogel saying she does a great talk on storytelling um, just amazing stuff about how how important storytelling is and I will tell you that with authentic leadership that storytelling piece is very important to convey you know who you are and your vision and, and things like that so this is really really important stuff all right well uh, we can definitely do some questions now but i wanted to make sure again that you have the uh, this is the email for wavaldi or you can go to our website at wvldi.org or do not hesitate to reach out to me this is my email address i would love to hear from you and, and chat or answer any questions that you may have. Thank right. you. Let's, um, just to just remind to everyone, everyone um, um, are, are, getting, are you getting are an echo?
What's that? Yes. Yeah, you're getting an yes, echo? there's an echo. Just a little bit, yeah. Quite sure why. Um, okay, let's see. Um, I just want to remind everyone that we, you know, Dr. Plutz would love to answer any questions. You can ask questions three different ways. You can put them in the chat, and the chat have, has been very active this, e this evening with people just chiming in and sharing their thoughts, and, and that's really what this is about as well. It's about discussion and questions and, and just really, um, you know, sharing our, our ideas and our thoughts. So if you have any questions, you can put those in the chat. You can also text them to 412 400 7447, or you can send an email to askcvp at cvpco, so cvpco.com. All right. Just looking through the chat here a little bit. Yeah. This is great. I love this. Oh, here's here's one. Um, one was, how can we join the Royal Canyon Group? Yeah, so um, right now it's available to everyone and um, it is on our, I'll, I'll drop this in the chat as well. Um, it's um, on our live CE site at my.royalcanon.com slash live CE. You can find not only the Women's Leadership Forum offerings, but you can also find other nutritional education. I'm going to put that in right now. Okay, perfect. And I know, um, can you talk a, even just a little bit? I believe that you just had your, the Royal, Royal Keenan just had their um, Women's Leadership um, Forum, correct? Well, it's still going on, um, oh. but we had, we've had our first few sessions. We have, um, we have a few more yet to come during um, November. So definitely check that out. Um, <laughs> just copy the disaster. <laughs> um, you, uh, yeah, definitely check that out because there's more offerings. I believe um, we have one more on the negotiation and two offerings of the storytelling. And then we're also going to be working with um, some of the affinity organizations. We, I know we have something planned with the Black DVM Network, a talk that we're going to be doing around um, women in leadership. And then we're also going to be doing something most likely with um, on a financial piece, talking about the importances of um, financial situations and, and issues for women in veterinary medicine. So the beauty of the beauty of what has happened this year is whereas we used to have to wait for one weekend to do all of our women's forum stuff, it's just going to be ongoing virtual content now. And then hopefully when the world decides to normalize a bit, then we can do some in-person events and maybe they'll start to look a little bit different. Can you also share the in the chat the um, uh, women's um, Veterinary Leadership Development Initiative website also. Can you share that as well? It is just wavaldi.org. Wavaldi.org. That's great. That's great. Um, I I will ask one question. You yeah. asked about, um, you know, really, you know, we as women often um, feel like we have to you know, be the, the the role model all the time. So whether we're at work, we, we you know, we're, we're playing the role of the leader at work, we're with our families, we're playing the role of whatever our family needs. And you talked about finding that balance. Um, you gave some some examples. Can you just reshare some of those examples of how it how to go about finding that balance? Yeah, you know, I think I, I, I certainly highlighted a lot that we tend to continue to just take everything on instead of saying, hey, I can't work as much and do all of this at home. So I don't know why it is so hard for us to ask for help, but it seems to be. So I think that's really what it's about, whether it's your husband, your partner, or maybe it's even your kids asking a little bit more for them. You know, you need to help this family as well and, and show up and do some of these things. And then the other flip side of that is at work, is really kind of trying to move away from that fear of, you know, I think we're always so afraid to say, like admit when we're at work that we we do have a family and it's, it's also important to us. I, you know, I think everybody values that a tremendous amount and, and, and you just need to get comfortable admitting that um, and asking for some adjustments. I think it's really just making those requests and it really boils down to 
asking for help so that you can really show up the way you want to. I think that's great. That is really great advice. Thank you. Um, we do have one question that came in over the chat. Um, do you have tips for self-talk or action when you are being authentic but believe experiencing a situation of implicit bias? Oh gosh, so you're you're facing, you know, what I have asked a lot of times is, I, I'm going to think of an example of, um, I will tell you some of the things that have been said to me. Let's just say, for example, um, I remember one time being told, you know, when you get really serious and you're talking about your plans and your ideas and things like that, and you're real serious, sometimes you seem kind of scary. I was, and I said, and so it, it kind of just took me aback. And what I've learned over time is when you get some kind of feedback like that, that you feel like might be rooted in a bias and not wanting to see that type of direct communication and, and clarity from a woman, um, I really, I have no problem asking. I'm just curious if, would you would you feel that same way? You know, would you describe a man in that same manner? Um, or if you're not comfortable with that, because that is a big risk, right? If, if you depending on the person, like you don't if you don't feel comfortable with that, I think it can also be. A, can you tell me more about why this comes across scary to you? Like or whatever it is that they said, can you tell me more about this and ask them to describe this? I think um, occasionally I've seen what happens with that is they actually kind of realize it when they're trying to explain it. Um, and it can really be a really gentle way, um, especially if you don't have a great relationship that you feel comfortable with the other approach to start that conversation and open the dialogue. Yeah, that's that's that is great advice. Um, we did have one more question come in over the um, chat. So does Vivaldi have a technician slash nurse leadership development team? So not specifically, but we really welcome all veterinary professionals. You do not need to be a veterinarian to be part of this community. Um, we, we cover a lot of things that apply to veterinary technicians. Um, so definitely you're welcome and you will find something here, but there's not something tailored specifically, but it's a pretty great idea. Maybe that's something down the road that we could do. Okay, great. Um, if there aren't any other questions, uh, again, I want to thank you all for um, engaging over the chat. I um, I definitely took a lot of notes. There were a lot of great resources, um, and I know that just from a couple of the comments that others were 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 jotting those down as well. Um, I just wanted to introduce myself. I did not introduce myself in the beginning. I'm Belinda Carter. I'm the Vice President of Marketing for Community Veterinary Partners. I wanna thank Dr. Pletz and the Women's um, Veterinary Leadership Development Initiative for being here and, and partnering with us on this Vet Fuel event this evening. Um, we are pleased to host these our Vet Fuel series um, every month. We've been partnering with uh, industry leaders to bring some really thought-provoking and, and conversations to the industry. So we appreciate everyone being um, with us this evening. I also want to thank Chris Steimer from Royal Canaan who introduced us to Dr. Pletz and said, I think that this would be a great topic for, um, for your um, vet, vet fuel series. So thank you, Chris, and thank you Royal Canaan for bringing this and partnering with us on this event this evening. Um, I'll be honest, we started this, this web series a few months ago because during the pandemic, we missed engaging with everyone. Um, you know, we would go to conferences, get to talk to different people across the industry, and I'm sure you're all, all feeling the miss on that as well. So this is why we, we started it. We wanted to be able to bring everyone together and still have some of those conversations, learn about you, your, your passions, and your work in veterinary medicine. Um, so, so it's important for us as a growing family of, 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 of veterinary hospitals at, at CVP um, focus on providing the best care possible to pets so that they, as Dr. Strong had mentioned earlier, to bring joy to families. Um, we know it is a paramount for us to continue to learn and discuss these important topics um, as an industry and as a community, and we hope that you will join us again for our next one. If there is a topic that you are interested in and you would love for us to have a vet fuel series um, um, event on, please email askcvp at cvpcode.com and we would absolutely entertain that. 
Um, you can also learn about other vet fuel um, events that are coming up on our website. So there is a vet fuel page on our website and we hope to see you again next month. So thank you all for joining. Um, and, and Dr. Plus, I don't know if you're catching the, the chat, but yeah, you're getting lots of, right. lots of thank yeah. yous. So thank yeah, you thank for engaging you. with us this evening. Yeah, you bet. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. And please, I was just dropping my email in the chat one more time. Please reach out for anybody that has further questions or wants to chat. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Enjoyed it. Enjoyed it. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you. You appreciate too. it. Thank you.